Hello, and welcome to uh, this virtual broadcast of the CSIS Energy Security and Climate Change Program. My name is Joseph Mike, and I'm the director of our program, and I'm very pleased to welcome you today wherever you are in the world. It's uh, Thursday morning here in Washington, D.C., but we've got guests from around the world bringing us their expertise on um, innovation in clean hydrogen markets. I'm very excited for today's discussion, and um, I look forward to engaging with everyone in our virtual audience via the Q&A function. If you've got a question throughout our program today, please feel free to use the Q&A box, and we will try to get to uh, as many audience questions as we can. This event will be archived and live streamed on the CSIS website for posterity. As we look at decarbonization, um, new the innovation of new technology is an absolute necessity to get to net zero. Coming out of Glasgow last year, the world has a very lofty ambition to reach net zero by mid-century. And there's very good news here. If, the, if countries hit the targets that they pledged or, or Refer or, or called their most ambitious uh, targets um, through the through the UN process. The IEA estimates that we might actually meet the first target of the Paris Climate Agreement, which is keeping global temperatures below two degrees centigrade of warming over the course of this century. And this is for people who are concerned about the risks of climate change, very good news. And it's a, a result that you might not have predicted would have come about maybe 10 years ago. But to accomplish that, it's going to require real technological innovation for many of the of the sectors that don't yet have the solutions necessary to live in, for us to live in a net zero world and still provide modern services to growing economies around the world. One of the key technologies that we are is coming into finer focus over the last few years is clean hydrogen. Hydrogen is it could be a very useful storage medium and transport medium for energy and would be able to supplant the use of uh, fossil fuels in a lot of sectors, heavy industry, transportation, building heating, power generation. And my impression is that around the world, clean hydrogen is having a bit of a moment. Whether it's blue hydrogen produced from fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage, whether it's hydrogen produced by electrolysis from renewables, green hydrogen, nuclear power, geothermal power, any low carbon power, um, countries around the world want to be top producers of, of clean hydrogen. One of the challenges, however, is we can talk about and you can create a computer model that will tell you, well, the economy will want to use clean hydrogen in all these different market segments for different purposes. But we actually need to build markets that will allow hydrogen to first be commercial and then to scale such that it can actually provide useful services in a, in a net zero world. And that part of the challenge, I think, has been relatively uncovered. It's a question of policy. It's a question of in government intervention, and it's a question of market formation. And I'm very excited today to welcome three experts who are looking at these challenges around the world. Dr. Kristen Westfeld joins us from H2 Global, a foundation in, in Europe that is looking to build market mechanisms for the use of these clean fuels. James Bowen joins us from Australia. He's been tracking Australian efforts to create regional hydrogen hubs, which will link producers with markets. And uh, Jitendra Rachaudhry joins us from CAPSARC, or the King Abdullah uh, Petroleum Studies uh, Research Center, excuse me, um, where he's been looking at hydrogen, uh, the efforts to build hydrogen economy in the kingdom. So we've got a, a conversation that spans the globe, uh, and I'm, I'm very excited to, to learn from our experts. Rather than me go on, I'd like to welcome each of them to offer some opening remarks. We'll begin with Kristen. Kristen, what what is happening is you look at you know in Europe there are now lofty goals for for clean hydrogen. How what's H two Global doing to actually build a real marketplace, and what do you see as the key challenges and opportunities here? Can you see my slides already? Not yet, right? Not yet. You're speaking. Not yet. I'm oh, speaking. Now you're now you're sharing your screen. Exactly, because what I brought is, and I excuse for that, some slides because um, I want to show and explain to you the mechanism of H2 Global, and it's easier to have the slides at hand because it's it's quite 
it's not complicated, but it's better, I think, to have a visualization in place. Um, so H2 Global is an instrument that has been funded by the German government um, and supported in 2021 with 900 million euros for first auctions. And as you, as you rightly say, I, I can only echo that the the support for creating markets is overlooked. We tend to talk about the market ramp up, but it's actually still about a technology ramp up and a, a leapfrogging into a market scheme. And this is what I'm trying to show you right now, because what is very clear, if we talk about the necessary um, demand and supply side, um, if you look into Germany's hydrogen demand, and that has been prior to Russia's war against Ukraine, then there's a wide range um, of potential hydrogen demand. It's, it's very unclear because, of course, it depends um, in which sectors hydrogen and its derivatives are allocated. But if you look to 2030, it, it, the figures still, if you have the range, they have a huge range, but still the figures are, are very high. And it's a, a gigantic um, jump that we have to do in increasing building up um, renewable energy and electrolysis capacity. And this is exactly what was behind um, creating this instrument. The idea that we immediately have to start scaling up the technologies. And in order to do so, you need a kind of bridging instrument because there is no clear and reliable regulation yet in place. The EU is still working on that. And this, of course, is a paradox if we want to raise this high investments in, in the industry um, and without having really the regulatory um, um, certainty. And this also means no business cases in place. So this is why the logic behind H2 Global is sort of bridging this regulatory gap, providing a business case because H2 Global steps in and gives um, the first um, consortium a, 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 an, an off-takers um, security. Then what is the other logic behind very important as well is it's a defined system. It is about long-term contracts on the purchase sites. And this is what I meant to give a long-term perspective for the first projects and to have a clear definition um, also with regard to the volume, uh, with regard to the products being bought um, and also with regard to the taxpayer. So it's a fixed amount of a financial sum and then and other auctions could take place. And twin auctions are being done on both sides. And I come back to that mechanism again so that you have this market simulation in place so that um, bidding, there are bidding procedures on the supply side for the long-term contracts. And then there are shorter auctions, shorter term auctions on the demand side. And I will um, 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 elaborate on that. Um, and what is also important is, of course, because we have this mismatch um, in supply and demand is also the point um, and the mismatch in pricing to have contracts for different schemes in order to have this financial compensation for the difference between those. And this is what I try to explain. You have this competition-based um, procurement process on the supply or on the purchase side with 10 years and consortium bidding all over the world. Then HINTCO, the Hint Hydrogen Intermediary Network company steps in, takes over at a certain point in the logistic chain physically the product also to provide the compensation of the price difference so this contract um, this this cost difference scheme and then also to organize um, the shorter term auctions on the supply or on the demand side and this is also competition based on that side the um, contracts or the deliveries will be um, shorter but basically one year um, auctions in order to um, um, allow prices to rise with the regulatory framework adjusted and the, uh, and the point that a value will be added to the green product by um, um, a respective regulation. 
that's basically um, the scheme behind. What is very important is that it's now one auction, uh, a global auction for three products of um, ammonia, methanol, and jet fuel. But the mechanism and the instrument can be used um, in a modular form. And we're talking about windows because it can be customized regarding to geographies, regarding to regions, which now is very important because you can start with diversification because we assume that the development, the technology ramp up and developing of the trade relations or, or, or logistical chains will be very much point to point and then a scaling on both sides but that doesn't help too much um, to create a market and this is the logic behind h2 global you can tailor the instrument and of course we will publish the prices that we're getting for the project so the, that you have the transparency and we will also publish of course the standards and criteria for the project for the products that we are buying so to have a, a reference point for other contracts and also price price wise and as i said it can be tailored and this is this kind of idea of a modular system we're looking now into uh, developing the next auctions with developing in emerging countries we are looking into using the mechanism for pure green hydrogen so this is what is meant with regard to PTX product selection. And of course, you can adjust that also to sustainability criteria and to, to specific targets from price optimization, as you see it here, to diversification, as I mentioned, or specifically to um, help with development policies. But this is what actually the foundation is doing in developing the instrument. And with that, I'm sorry for the rush through the instrument, but um, I hope I could enlighten some points and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you kindly. I, I think it's a really interesting instrument. And in maybe I can ask a brief question before we move on. Um, do you have, you know, Repower EU and, and the response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine has really cha dramatically changed European energy policy in, over the course of the past couple of months. And there's an enormous target for green hydrogen in the latest iteration of, of the Repower EU plan. Uh, 20 million tons a year by 2030, right? Just an enormous scale up of, of global production, let alone consumption in Europe. Um, how do you see that mechanism affecting the plans of your, or that that plan affecting the plans of, of H2 Global or, or H2 Global working within that, that structure? Yeah, excellent point. I mean, there is, if you look through the footnotes of the Repower EU plan, there is a mentioning of the H2 global scheme, mentioning that the platform will draw on the experience. And this is this is um, a very important point, which I normally don't show in, in this very quick um, um, explanation of the presentation, but it's indeed a learning tool, both because you have this modular scheme, you can take the best practices and then tailor the um, following auctions, but it also provides a learning space reducing search and transaction cost for the industry, because we are for the first time putting, let's say, together the logistical and the value chain, which is not a foregone. Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, I look forward to follow up and in, in further discussion. We've had several uh, questions come into the Q&A uh, for audience members who've joined us. We are we're tracking those. We're going to kind of compile them and, and, and make sure they get addressed. So more questions arise, please do uh, bring them to our attention. Um, uh, James Bowen is, is a research fellow at uh, the Perth US Asia Center. He's followed uh, the Australian uh, developments in hydrogen. Australia is a good case because for me, because uh, Australia has a program that's trying to use hub models, regional innovation hubs, to connect producers uh, with, uh, with customers uh, for clean hydrogen. And this is, a, this is a mechanism that the United States is trying to uh, um, use itself to, um, to develop clean energy, to develop or to innovate in the, in the clean hydrogen space. So James, very interesting to hear from you an update of what's happening in Australia, how the hub model is is being used to address the problem of of market formation. 
Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Um, and thanks uh, to the other speakers. It's really a really great event and I'm, I'm thrilled to participate. Uh, so, so the creation of hydrogen hubs is one of the, uh, one of the key commitments under Australia's natural hydrogen strategy. Uh, and just to give a bit of background, that, that strategy, um, you know, it's really uh, as much or even more about economic development um, than just purely around decarbonisation. So, so the, the strategy targets billions of dollars a year uh, in new GDP and thousands of new jobs. Um, and there's also a really big focus on the export market and uh, managing the transition in uh, some of Australia's key export markets, uh, mainly uh, in Northeast Asia. So the headline target um, of that strategy is Australia becoming a, a top three hydrogen exporter to Asia. Uh, and the, the essential motivation behind the hubs model uh, is to expedite the achievement of scale and cost reductions, uh, you know, both, both for the domestic market and to tap those export opportunities. And, and the main thinking behind it is, um, is to achieve that scale and cost reductions through co-location of activity along the value chain. So production, storage, transport, end use. Uh, and there's a big focus on sector coupling, so industry transportation, power generation being co-located, and then again, a link between domestic and export outcomes. So hubs are looking to leverage existing strengths in infrastructure or, or share the development of new assets to achieve cost sharing benefits. They also look to exploit the industrial capable workforces or to improve training and, and development where those are lacking. And, and there's also some existing um, strong capacity for not only creating new decarbonisation op decarbonization opportunities, but actually decarbonising existing supply chains uh, at the same time as building up new opportunities. And uh, obviously some, some opportunities for innovation, technology deployment. So I just need to uh, point out that Australian hydrogen interests are targeting both uh, both renewable hydrogen and um, fossil fuel based uh, platforms. So, so there's also a focus within the hub model on um, sites that have access to both renewables and, and gas. Um, uh, so there has actually already been a little bit of um, coal based hydrogen production in Australia as well. Actually, uh, the first uh, shipment of liquefied hydrogen from Victoria, from say Victoria to Japan earlier uh, this year, was based on, on coal, but most, uh, most production is looking at um, gas or, or renewables based um, production. So, so the, hub, the hub program essentially is run through a program called the Clean Hydrogen Industrial Hubs Program, which is uh, essentially a grant making process. Uh, and that funds implementation and also design of, of, of hubs. About half a billion Australian dollars or 350 million um, US has been allocated to, to that so far. And, and that's uh, on a matched funding basis to applicants. And that's about a third of the total funding the Australian government has actually allocated to hydrogen in total. So quite a significant part of the strategy, as I said, is, is this hubs program. So the applicants to that um, process have to be consortia of parties, but it's not limited to just industry. So state and territory governments have also been able to apply, uh, but they have to partner with industry. Um, and actually this, this process is quite well advanced. So the federal government actually became, began um, identifying suitable sites before the National Hydrogen Strategy was released and has gradually kind of whittled down what it sees as uh, the six key locations around the country. But the application to the grants making process wasn't necessarily um, limited to those locations. They were just uh, found to have the best kind of uh, combination of factors to, uh, to be desirable and attract industry interests. So um, the, the first round of the grant making process, um, and there's not necessarily uh, any indication that the process will continue over subsequent grants, uh, subsequent rounds, but that's already closed. And so there are actually six grants were made, um, were um, allocated for implementation of advanced hub proposals. And there are also another nine further grants that actually went out to uh, consortia or parties making um, proposals based on design and de developmental studies or future hub design. They weren't necessarily at the stage of, of implementing their proposals. So, so the location of the successful applicants didn't quite marry up to the areas that were suggested by government, but they were pretty close. Um, and they also have a combination of those factors I mentioned, existing industry, cross value chain interests, export capacity, strong workforce, uh, and so on. And there's also a mix of green and blue, um, and sometimes even in the same proposal. So, so just to give one idea um, of one successful project um, is the Pilbara Hydrogen Hub, uh, which is in my, my home state of Western Australia. And that was developed by a state government-led consort, uh, consortium. Um, 
And it's taking place in, in basically the resource centre of Australia, both for mining and LNG existing um, operations there. There's also some value adding activity that already occurs in that region around mineral processing, fertiliser plants, so using gas um, and uh, you know, using, uh, there's also a, a lot of penetration of renewable energies that are actually powering those plants already as well. So there's a very strong export focused infrastructure, um, port infrastructure, highly capable workforce in those areas as well. So, so some elements of the, the successful plan there included a hydrogen or ammonia pipeline that would connect um, two key strategic industrial areas in the region. There's a provision for the creation of a clean energy training and research institute with presence in two regional towns. Uh, also port upgrades to facilitate exports when they do eventually uh, you know, reach that level. So the state government bids were supported by major research uh, resources industry companies, um, including Woodside as a gas company, Fortescue Future Industries, which is the, the sort of clean energy arm of a major iron ore mining company, Fortescue Metals Group in Australia, BP was also involved, the Australian Gas Infrastructure Group, Yarra, Pilbara is a fertiliser company, uh, a few renewable energy companies as well. So, so um, you know, a really wide spectrum of parties involved. Uh, as I said, a lot of uh, different end use cases, different ends of the sectors of the value chain. And basically the, the work period for activities that are covered by the, the grants process is uh, 3.5 years. Um, so the, uh, we'll start to see some activity probably, you know, developing very soon and hopefully developing over that period. And, and, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, this is the first round of grants that were actually allocated, but um, they've actually, the, the allocated grants actually used up most of the funding that's currently available. So I'm not necessarily certain that there's, there's further commitments happening. I think that there's probably going to be a, a process of waiting and seeing around the progress process of these original projects. Um, and I need to, um, you know, also stress that we've, we've also had a recent change of government in Australia. So I do, don't anticipate that there'll be a lack of support for this hubs um, process ongoing, but um, we're now much in a, very much in a position of, um, of the groundwork having been laid and, and seeing how these projects develop over the next few years. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a really an interesting model. When you have, you, you mentioned the, the recent award cycle, you made a comment that the, the, the projects or the regions where that won grants were maybe slightly different than what the government asked for or had directed, what were the criteria that you think led to led to the difference, right? How, how were like nascent hub projects being evaluated and what were the key criteria that led to some projects winning and some not? Yeah, so I mean, I think the the, uh, the original allocation of key sites, um, there was probably a little bit of maybe political reasons around that because there was one um, there was one key site per Australian state conveniently uh, or territory, uh, and the the initial the eventual proposals kind of didn't quite marry up to that. There was a couple in Western Australia, for example, um, but I mean, uh, I think if you started out with looking at um, where you thought these were going to develop, you'd probably hit on a lot of the key sites that were, were already uh, that, that they arrived at. So the Pilbara was an obvious one from my perspective because you have just intense industrial activity already occurring there, gas industry co-located, renewables potential, pipelines, um, port infrastructure, capable workforce, and, and most of the other um, sites around Australia were very, were broadly similar. So another, so Australia, West Australia, for example, is the iron ore mining capital of, of Australia. Queensland, another state where there was one of these projects with the coal mining and also coal seam gas to, to LNG uh, export centre of Australia as well. So, so a lot of opportunities there around decarbonising existing industries, making the transition to hydrogen eventually. Um, I think in the in the iron ore space as well, looking at potential for perhaps green metals production as well. As I said, there's also fertiliser plants. So just a really intense co-location of end uses, uh, ind industrial uses, across the value chain is the real key, key criteria. Yeah, we've been doing some research here on how hubs in the United States might work. And it's really amazing the power that clustering has both to foster innovation and to the, reduce the cost of things, right? You can often think about these hubs as like physical structures, factory, pipeline, end use plant, but really the clustering comes from a variety of different institutions all working together to, to, to create an innovation, innovation ecosystem. Yeah, and I just would just add one more thing. I have to say that basically, I mean, as I said, Australia's strategy 
very intensely focused on the export market as well. So a lot of these sites are near port infrastructure, near existing export-based industries as well. So that's a huge consideration in terms of what was selected in Australia, I'm pretty sure. Right. Um, Jitendra is a research fellow at, at CAPSARC and has been looking at the, the strategies that uh, Saudi, are going on, or Saudi Arabia is taking as it thinks through uh, making large investments in hydrogen production. I think also with an eye toward exports, but Jitendra, happy to hear some opening comments from you about how these kind of hub act, how these hub models or or how clean how clean hydrogen markets are seen developing from a Middle East perspective. Thanks, thanks, Joseph. Uh, just want to make sure that you can hear me because uh, that seems to be the catch it for all webinars where for a successful webinar you need to have somebody on mute and talking. So I just wanted to make sure about that. You're coming through loud and clear. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Joseph, and to the CSTM, uh, CSI team, CSIS team for inviting me on this uh, great panel. Uh, the number of segues that have been given both by Kirsten and James, are they are enough to you know, so put together a four-wheel drive? So I'll use some parts of what Kirsten has mentioned and what uh, James has mentioned and try and put together uh, what the kingdom is trying to do. So if you look at uh, the industrial activity in the kingdom, uh, a lot of that is focused on co-location and uh, clustering of capabilities and skill sets and also the ability to use the feed from one plant as uh, uh, the output from one plant as the feed uh, feedstock for another. Uh, and that adds into a sort of a uh, overall value chain. So if you were to look at uh, what the kingdom is trying to do with hydrogen overall, uh, obviously we have the uh, green hydrogen hub, which is coming up in Neom. But if you look at uh, overall hydrogen hubs existing in the kingdom, then there's a uh, uh, Jubail on uh, the Arabian Gulf on the East Coast, and there's Yanbu on the West Coast on the Red Sea. These are uh, huge petrochemical hubs. They produce a, a number of uh, products uh, for export, some for domestic consumption. Uh, and these are using hydrogen as a part of their industrial uh, feedstock as it is, some for producing ammonia, some for producing uh, methanol, some for producing uh, DRI steel, uh, some as a part of uh, uh, oil uh, refining. Uh, so there's uh, already a, uh, an existing uh, skill set uh, and a very good understanding of using hydrogen, which exists in the kingdom. And, and what the kingdom is trying to do with hydrogen uh, as an export vector is to try and utilize it as an additional revenue generator for the kingdom. It ties in very nicely with uh, the vision 2030 in terms of economic diversification away from uh, an oil-based uh, revenue stream. It ties in with uh, the kingdom's uh, decarbonization plans and climate uh, aspirations and goals. It allows the kingdom to reach out to newer markets using newer products. It allows the kingdom to export green plastics in that sense. It could potentially allow the kingdom to export uh, ammonia, which would be green, which would allow uh, other countries to produce maybe urea at the state uh, where they are. The additional advantage is that uh, the kingdom also has that it's also uh, placing itself as a carbon capture utilization and sequestration hub. The kingdom already has uh, successful applications where it is using captured carbon to produce value-added products, urea and methanol uh, in, in Sabic on the East Coast. So the kingdom has progressed quite a lot. Uh, it has uh, existing examples of the hub uh, infrastructure. What it's trying to do is leverage the capacity that the kingdom has built over a period of time in, times, uh, in terms of being able to manage and deliver really high uh, complex mega projects and to leverage them and, and venture into the green hydrogen market. That's it. Thank you. Um, you know, when you think about the, the use of existing infrastructure and existing markets, so you mentioned hydrogen consumption in chemical manufacturing, petrochemical uh, uh, refining, it, you know, how much does how much is that an important early market for for clean hydrogen production in the in the strategies that you're watching? 
It, uh, okay, so let's, uh, I'll go back to what uh, Kirsten was trying to uh, say in terms of formulating a, a demand side uh, market. So it, for the kingdom, there are currently, I mean, not just for the kingdom, for any green hydrogen producer globally, there are primarily two markets. One is Germany and the other one is Japan. These are the two demand centers which are there which are a willing to support potential exporters with both capital and technology. So for any potential exporter trying to capture these markets, you have to have products which will go into these markets much easier. Uh, building on uh, the, the theme of the webinar, which is looking at uh, building clean hydrogen markets, it's more going to be a demand pull from the established markets as to what's the product that they are looking for, which could enable them. So for instance, if uh, Japan is looking to decarbonize its power sector, which currently is quite uh, uh, fossil fuel intensive, and, and they, are, uh, they are still trying to bring the nuclear uh, fleet on board. So there's an opportunity over there to export uh, ammonia. Uh, which then goes into uh, direct firing with uh, uh, with coal to reduce the the uh, GHG emissions. Uh, this would be obviously blue ammonia, where the uh, where the carbon dioxide produced during uh, the production is captured. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Germany; there are opportunities in Germany to uh, export hydrogen directly and it could go into multiple applications in in germany it could go into transport it could go into production of steel it could go into production of uh, value added chemicals it could go into production of uh, plastic so there are, the markets will demand uh, will decide what sort of product stream is of more attraction to them based on how they want to decarbonize and how they prioritize which sector of the economy they would like to decarbonize mm -hmm. Maybe that maybe that leads to an, a good question for Kirsten, which is, you know, H two Global has we must have a lot of criteria for the the materials like the forms of hydrogen that that is gonna are gonna go through this clearinghouse and how they're made and where they come from. How how were those decisions made and and how do you think about and how and how is H two Global thinking about the sourcing side of of market development? Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. I, I've seen also the, the questions in the chat. Maybe I combine that with, with a number of questions. With regard to criteria, yes, indeed. Um, the criteria will be green um, PTX products. And of course, also oriented to the sustainable development goals because this is um, government funding in that round of auctions provided by the Ministry for Economics and, and Climate Action. So um, it is, um, the point is that the funding comes from the government. I've seen the question whether the whole endeavor is, is a state one. And I have to say, no, it's not. It's to me, it's a very innovative public private um, institution um, where the, the funding for the, the foundation comes from industry. And it's not just German industries. It's basically really right now becoming international from uh, European companies to Canadian companies um, at almost yeah more than 35 right now. So there is a big interest um, in the industry in supporting um, also the, 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 the research and analytical work we're doing in order to kick off the market ramp up. So it, it's again, it's, it's public private, even though the funding for the auctions is coming from, from um, the government. And, and here the criteria were very strict in Germany. Um, so the, the point was that public funding should only go into green hydrogen. That's a political decision um, th to make th that very clear. Um, I'm also a member of the German National Hydrogen Council and with that head on, uh, you get other also broader uh, answers from my side that I think also that we need uh, other colors or um, climate neutral hydrogen in order to ramp up 
the market. But it, I think it's it's very fair and it's right to test really um, green criterion in order to also see whether this works. And this is what I meant with the learning to, um, um, instrument. What I also saw is the, the issue around the products. And maybe I could quickly comment on that, on ammonia, why ammonia, methanol, and jet fuel. I think that's quite obvious because we want to be operational actually this year. We want to start with the auctions this year. So we have to build on existing, let's say, structures for feedstock use of these products, as well as a functioning transport vector. And, and this is why, why ammonia, um, methanol, and a jet fuel are in, in this round. But of course, the next um, waves, hopefully, you should look into pure um, green hydrogen as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, there is a, a vigorous array of que uh, questions coming in through the chat. One of the things that always comes up when we're talking about hydrogen is the color spectrum, right? Green, blue, fuchsia, turquoise, pink, red. I don't think there's red. Um, but you know how you know James. The, how how is you, you mentioned a lot of even some hubs have multiple sources, right? Multiple flavors or colors of of hydrogen within the Australian hubs program. But you know how in from the Australian perspective, are you are you are you seeing considerations of like emissions intensity arise? And do we need a, a better vocabulary for the emissions intensity of hydrogen if we can expect global markets to actually grow? So there's, yeah, that's a really interesting debate around this in Australia. Um, so, you know, and a lot of it is political. I think you know, Kirsten touched on that at, at a German level. I think in the Australian, um, uh, scenario is actually the opposite, where the previous government had a much stronger preference for uh, fossil fuel based pathways and was looking to extend a lot of financial support to CCS. Um, and but the so the federal government had that uh, perspective, but the state and territory governments had their own individual strategies that focus exclusively on renewable energies in a lot of cases as well. And a lot of the industry, um, export focused industry focus I've seen as well, has also been um, green hydrogen um, based, has been renewables based. Uh, and a lot of the, um, you know, the the big picture um, opportunities in Australia have always been to seen to be Japan and Korea who don't have that intense focus on, on green hydrogen, but a lot of the actual commercial uh, deals that are happening at the moment are focused on Europe because of that green hydrogen focus. So, so I think that's a natural kind of um, uh, sort of sorting out of, you know, um, comparative advantages to some extent that Australia does, you know, have incredible renewables intensity, have incredible uh, availability of land for um, renewable capacity, and to some extent that there is a natural inclination to um, to tap that comparative advantage in Australia for renewables that uh, you know, doesn't, to some extent, to, to the same extent, ex exist in the, in the blue sort of space. So, so I think that, you know, different jurisdictions around the, around the world will actually find that um, natural comparative advantage in those different colour pathways. Um, in terms of the emissions intensity, I think that, uh, you know, a really key to actually resolving that question is around certification. Um, so, you know, actually providing uh, guidance to the market around what they're, what, what, they're, what is being produced and what they're consuming. So Australia has its own um, sort of certification guidelines called guarantee of origin um, in development at the moment through going through industry testing. Uh, but I know that, uh, you know, that's a green standard kind of happening at the moment as well. So I think certification is really key on that side. Uh, Jitendra, very interested in your views on that, um, and and how and how you see strategies evolving or or markets evolving. Like, are we just going to have uh, parallel markets in in different flavors of hydrogen, or or you know, do the do the institutions we build now create enough flexibility that the market may be taken over by the one that that ends up being the most scalable or the least expensive? Uh, I, I'll be blunt in this one. Uh, the colors, they're just uh, the, uh, the thought process of uh, academics and researchers. Uh, I mean, when it comes down to a contract, you can specify that it's going to be green hydrogen. No one will believe you because there will be penalties associated. So over a period of time, the, the hydrogen market also will stratify or segment into what's the carbon uh, uh, intensity of the production process. And it will follow a similar process as already is there in oil where 
APIs or specific gravity and the amount of sulfur in oil uh, defines whether you have an opportunity to charge a premium or to you have to give a discount because it's just too sour. So over a period of time, hydrogen will follow the same, same, same pathway where in the initial stages, there will be premiums available, but as volumes kick in into the market and the market starts to uh, become uh, bigger, it will start to stratify. So you will have uh, the carbon intensity figures starting to come into the picture. And, and uh, let's be honest, uh, whoever is going to be importing green hydrogen, they are looking to decarbonize their uh, their sector. If they are going to be decarbonizing their sector, they have to measure the carbon intensity of their production processes. So the carbon in intensity of uh, green hydrogen production process will also feed into the overall uh, uh, calculation that uh, these countries uh, which are consuming hydrogen will be looking at. So uh, these colors, they will be gone. <laughs> I like I like it. I like the bluntness. You know, it's like uh, eventually it's like it's all going to be hydrogen, and 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 uh, eventually market dynamics will overtake politics. But for the moment, it's states that are making a lot of these investments, right? You know, we have we have government funding for a public private partnership in H two Global. We have government funding for these hub in, these hub institutions or hub constructions in Australia and 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 in the kingdom. So, Jitender, how do you think about or how does it how does that work in a in, in a Saudi context? You know, the 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 state versus the development of a marketplace, either like domestically or internationally, and and how do you how how are what are the dynamics that might come into play there? So. Uh... From a perspective of, of a new uh, market which is going to be developed, it always makes sense for the state to stand behind that market. And uh, this is critical because uh, hydrogen at this point of time is more of a bilateral government to government effort where the government has the sovereign uh, backstop sort of way, uh, in a way of uh, uh, writing the checks and funding uh, the innovation or, or the new product projects which are coming on stream. Uh, the private sector will, over a period of time, will be brought in. It's happening in somewhere uh, the state capacity exists to be able to absorb those uh, private inputs, but mostly it will be the state which will fund it because, uh, let's be again blunt, it's the state which has the opportunity and the ability to absorb that risk that's inherent in such a new fuel. So from that perspective, you always use bilateral pacts between governments to be able to establish markets. And then once a market is established, then you have a multilateral approach to try and deepen it. When I say a multilateral approach to deepen it, what I'm talking about is certifications. Certifications means acceptability within a bigger group. That is multilateralism. Mm. Uh, then you have, uh, uh, let's say, an export of a product, uh, which is... Uh, made by uh, with green hydrogen from one country to another and it passes through multiple uh, countries then that's again a multilateral approach where they decide not to levy uh, duties or i mean uh, this is the way you will deepen a hydrogen market so from uh, where i stand a bilateral uh, uh, approach which is backed by sovereign guarantee on both sides allows the market to be formed once that market is formed, the risks are reduced, the opportunities are prevalent. That's when the private sector can come in and be able to take advantage of uh, the reduced risk. And from a systemic uh, financial point of view, it helps everyone. Mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned at the top that it feels that hydrogen is having a bit of a moment in, in global energy uh, planning, maybe maybe it's entirely an academic one, but as we look at these implements uh, starting to lead to projects or, or auctions, I'm interested in each of your thoughts on you know two or three years from now, five years from now, how do we metric success? How do we know that these? So, so maybe we can start with James. How do we you know if you think about the Australian hubs program five years from now, what is what is what is success for that? For that program look like um, from an Australian perspective or from a global one? 
Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, there's just a really strong alignment with the national hydrogen strategy is, is really key. Um, and, you know, there are set criteria that the government has actually set for, you know, making these grants and, you know, a lot of them around formation of partnerships, joint ventures, um, new activities for export markets, offtake agreements is going to be a really critical thing because of the export focus, um, new infrastructure. But, uh, you know, the, as I said, I mean, the hydrogen hub model essentially is all about bringing down costs and achieving scale. So that's, those are the two essential criteria. Um, and because of that intense export focus as well, there's going to be, uh, from the Australian perspective, they will want to see, the Australian government will want to see its investment pay off in terms of an offtake agreement, in terms of, uh, you know, much cheaper hydrogen production, uh, probably, you know, by the end of the decade, having some sort of export at scale arrangements in place. And, and Kirsten, for, from your perspective, success looks like a, a, a marketplace that's working on, on both ends of the auction system, more capital flowing into these buying mechanisms. Yeah, of, of course, um, that, that would be a good step. I think um, having another module ready, maybe for intra-EU um, with regard to the Repower EU and, and also for pure hydrogen. But you asked me for the very short term or mid-term th three years. I, I think I would like to have transparent price signals from the first auctions because so far we are only having estimations and very best guesses, but not more. I would like to have um, transparent standards norms and as Jitendra also said, a, a functioning chain of custody from production to at least the delivery point where, where our hint code takes over. And of course, in three years, I, I very much hope and I rely on um, that the first auctions on the supply side long term are done and we will have the deliveries and we might we will be in the preparation of the first sales auction into the market. Um, but this is the narrow view on H2 Global. As I, as I say, the, the, the big added value is putting a, a logistical and value chain together mm. and to ha ha having the first best practices and lessons learned. Before I started, I, I maybe had the illusion that this is more a foregone how to put this together, but I'm now really realizing that this is a huge lap, a huge step even to make. And so I think we have to really think through the sequencing. And I also understand James in that way. Um, we, you, you have the, the hydrogen valleys that, that develop inside Europe. And around that, you have the kind of regional functioning market scheme. So that would be already kind of market functioning with price signals, with, with, with auctions, with decreasing market barriers for other actors. Because why is this so important that we're talking about the market? It's actually about decreasing barriers. It's actually about bringing central players in, but also decentralized. So that's the big, big added value of creating a sort of a marketplace with transparent um, mechanism and, and signals and and then of course um the global market is is taking some time but i think what is very important i very much like jitendra's point on on the segmentation of the market and what we need to assure is really that the interfaces work between the different schemes that there is a certain interoperability in, in trade so that we don't have close regions and close ties yeah, one of the, I mean, a complement H2 Global, one of the things I think is so interesting about your model is it allows for new entrants, right? If you, yeah. if, 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 exactly. a, if a hydrogen hub uh, is just a production facility, a storage facility, and an end user, and there's a 100% contracting scheme between these three, then that limits the ability for there to be innovation because you know, who knows if like this end use case is the most efficient one, if they're willing to pay the highest price, if that firm drops out, how do you bring in new entrants? And so mechanisms like the one you're using to me, when we're thinking about such a nascent technology are very, very interesting. 
Exactly. That's exactly what I tried to say, because we will see anyway these big point to point deals from steel, from big producers to steel companies, but that doesn't help. And that creates problems in the infrastructure as well with congestion. So you quickly have to um, leapfrog basically into a market system. You have to assure that you have third party access to pipelines to storages. Storages are extremely important because we don't need the big ones for security of supply, but we also need the smaller ones close to the customer in, in particular in the ramp up phase. And this will be challenging and expensive. But if you want to have this, this market developing, then you need these close to customer storage facilities for the balancing as well. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think it, I, I'm, I'm interested to see- and third party access. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm just, I'm really interested that that's where innovation is, right? If the goal for a lot of these programs is economic development, you never know what's going to scale, right? That's, a, it's a question of the market and, and re government regulation and a variety of other things. And so some flexibility seems very important. I think it's really interesting to see creative mechanisms being deployed as part of the development of clean hydrogen uh, uh, as a, as a market. Um, you know, we're we're running close on time, and and we respect all of your uh, busy schedules, and greatly appreciate your expertise. But I also want to offer uh, a moment for any final thoughts. Um, just one last one from me. Congratulations to Emmanuel, who has been very active in the Q and I hope we've covered a lot of the things that you and and others brought up. Jitendra, do you have any final thoughts for us today? I think we are at the start of something which is going to take a lot of effort. We are underestimating hugely the amount of effort and the problems that will come up. It's not going to be an easy ride. So it's better that we are prepared and are stoic about the failures that will inevitably come up. So. <laughs> Excellent point. Thank you, James. Yeah, I mean, I would tend to echo those thoughts that uh, a lot of countries are taking very big bets on hydrogen at the moment in Australia in particular, and the market's not there yet. So, I mean, there has to be some sort of uh, uh, patience around perhaps the opportunities will not develop as quickly as uh, are intended. They won't be as big in scale as possible. They have to, you know, countries have to hedge their bets to some extent in a lot of cases. And we'll finish with Kirsten. Well, I'm I'm convinced that we we need hydrogen and derivatives. It's it's a, one of the missing pillars for a, a clean energy system, and and of, of course green, um, the green colors. Um, I, if if you talk about climate neutrality, we we need huge amounts of of green electrons and molecules. I I agree with Jitendra that it will be a huge effort that requires governments, industries, and societies. And for that, I really think that we have to allow ourselves for, for learning spaces and experimental spaces. And that doesn't mean um, pilot projects, but, but future ones, but really allow for mistakes, allow for best practices, worst best practices, and of course, collaboration internationally will be key. Yes, and this is another place where I think some of these clustering mechanisms like hubs or valleys as they can be called in Europe can be very helpful, right? One firm drops off, one end use doesn't work and, and something else can come and fill the void, right? We, we, we shouldn't think about them as like, okay, I've got this project, it's end to end, it's point to point. We really need to think about how do we build ecosystems? That's been a message that has come up again and again out of, out of our work. And we've seen in a variety of other innovation spaces, did you know, chip manufacturing uh, and, and other places where government support was important to uh, regional centers being developed. Uh, what can I say? I appreciate all of your time. I agree this is going to be a challenge. It'll be exciting to watch it happen over the next decades. Thank you all for your efforts, your expertise today. And uh, I appreciate you very much for our guests. I hope that you've taken as much from this program as I have. The CSIS uh, Energy Program has been doing quite a bit of work on hydrogen. We look forward to doing more, and we hope to see you all in the future. Uh, virtual round of applause to our guests, and my kind thanks, and a fine evening, afternoon, or morning to you all. <laughs>